Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to Fermentology. I'm Karen Ciccone from the NC State University Libraries based in Raleigh, North Carolina in the United States. And I'm subbing today for Michelle Jewell, who's away on a secret mission. Fermentology is a mini seminar series on the culture, science, and history of your everyday fermented foods. We have had guests from all over the planet join us on a semi-weekly basis since April of 2020, and recordings of all the previous talks are available on the Applied Ecology YouTube page. I'll share that link in the chat in just a minute. Um, we'll have a live Q&A after the talk, so please ask questions using the Q&A feature. Unfortunately, I won't be able to get to everyone's questions during the Q&A, but I'll do the best I can. Today's guest is Dr. Sarah Bowen. She's a professor of sociology at NC State and the author of Divided Spirits, Tequila, Mezcal, and the Politics of Production. She's gonna tell us the stories of tequila and mezcal and how they evolved and why people are still fighting over them. Welcome, Dr. Bowen. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of you for being here. I'm excited to talk a little bit about tequila and mezcal with you. So I'm going to start out by talking a little bit about how, where this all started. How did tequila and mezcal originate? And people in Mexico have been battling over the right to make and sell mezcal and tequila, which are two of Mexico's most iconic products for centuries. The word mezcal comes from the Nahuatl word, words metal, meaning agave, and ixcali, meaning cooked or baked. And the colonial settlers at first used the word mezcal to refer to the agave plants that they saw the indigenous populations consuming and drinking in fermented beverages. There are more than 100, 200 species of agave, which is also known in Mexico as maguey. And agave is a succulent that thrives in dry climates and it's endemic to Mexico. Of those 200 species, 150 are found in Mexico. And you can see from the map, they're spread out all over the country. Indigenous populations in Mexico have relied on agave for thousands of years, using it for food and fermented beverages. Um, pulque is the one that's best known and to make textiles, rope and paper. Eventually the word mezcal shifted to refer to the distilled agave spirits, which is how we understand it today. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, how to make mezcal and how mezcal is made. But before that, just a little bit more background. So there's some debates over whether the indigenous populations in Mexico were distilling mezcal before the arrival of the colonialists. But there is agreement that it became really widespread starting in the 1600s. And the first distilled agave spirits likely originated in Colima in the volcanoes region, which is in Mexico. Uh, in Western Mexico. And the earliest documented references that are like actually written down are from 1619, but many people believe they were making it well before that. So if we're gonna talk about making mezcal, we start with the agave, which you see here. So historically agave grew wild and then people would harvest it and bring it back uh, by donkey or on maybe even on the backs of their own bags. Over time, people started cultivating it, although people in some regions still use wild agave and that picture is from not very long ago. The spines of the agave plant make it look like a big cactus, but really it's more closely related botanically to flowering plants like hyacinths or asparagus. So mezcal, which I'm gonna talk a lot about, is made from many varieties of agave. And there are some producers that still use wild agave, like you see on the left. But tequila is made from one species only, agave tequilana weber or blue agave. And it's almost always grown in these huge monoculture fields using chemical intensive practices like you see on the right. So that's the blue agave for tequila on the right. So agave, one of the unique things about agave and also one of the things that has always made it hard to manage supply and demand is that it takes six to eight years to mature after it's planted. And that's for the blue agave that's used to make tequilas. Um, the tequila companies are trying to push this to, to be shorter and they have succeeded to some degree, although that is not without controversy. And then some of the other varieties take much longer. They can take as long as 15 years to um, mature. Once the spines of the plant have been chopped away, 
by a jimador, which is an agave harvester, which you see in that picture. The piña, which you can kind of see in the one picture, it's called a piña, which means pineapple because it kind of looks like a pineapple, is revealed. And there's a lot of romanticization of the jimador. You see this in the picture on the left, that's from a distillery tour. So this is a person that was silently chopping away at the piñas, he was wearing all white clothes, but these romantic images conceal how terrible the working conditions are for the jimadores in terms of both pay and in terms of the work itself is really hard. So it's really hard on your body and people can't do it for all that long. So once we have the piñas, they need to be roasted. Traditionally, mezcal producers would roast them in earthen pits. They would line these pits with stone, then cover them with layers of dirt, stone, and fiber mats. This is a process that takes several days and it gives mezcal its characteristic smoky flavor. Tequila um, for a long time has been roasted in masonry ovens and that's why it's less smoky in its taste. But some tequila and mezcal producers, the more industrial ones also use autoclaves to cook the agave, which is faster and they would say more precise in terms of cooking. After the peanuts are roasted, they need to be chopped or mashed. And historically, this was done by hand, and some people still do it this way, as we see here. This man is using a hollowed out canoe and a wooden mallet or ax to chop the peanuts. And then, as you can see, we haven't started talking about fermentation yet, but he's going to do that directly in the ground, which is relatively rare, but, but still happens. For chopping, other producers use a stone wheel called a tahona, and it can be pulled by a donkey or a horse or a tractor. These were introduced in some places during the colonial period, and then the larger distilleries um, in, in tequila started using mechanical shredders around 1950. But most of the small producers, like this one, still chop their agave by hand or use a tahona. And then once the piñas are chopped or shredded, the mezcal producers ferment the mash. So most um, traditional mezcals are fermented with the agave fibers mixed right in with the juices, which you can see there. The mechanical shredders and some of the tahonas press the juices out of the mash. So in this case, it's just the juices that are being more fermented, which is more efficient. And this is much, much more common in the case of tequila. The process could take several weeks. Um, or it could be a little bit shorter. Some mescal producers ferment their mescal in pits in the ground, like we saw. Others use wooden, plastic, or cement then vats or animal hides. Most mescal producers do not add anything during fermentation, which makes the process take a long time. Industrial producers might yet add yeast or other things to speed it up. And then finally, we're ready for distillation. So mezcal producers slowly distill the fermented juices in wood-fired stills. And the first mezcal producers back several hundred years ago likely used a, virgin, a version of what archaeologists call the Filipino still, which is an adaptation of the stills that were used by Filipino settlers to make coconut wine in the 16th and 17th century. So the Filipino still looks a lot like this. Um, this kind of still consists of an earthen stone or wooden base, two metal pans, and a hollow tree trunk. They build a fire in the base below the tree trunk, and then one of the metal pans that's placed on top of the trunk and directly above the fire is holding the fermented mash. The other one is the one that you can see and that sits on top. Cool water continually runs in and out of the top kettle. And when the heat from the mash rises and hits the cooktop created by that water, condensation occurs. The resulting condensation or mescal drips into an agave leaf that runs into a piece of bamboo, which you can see it's cut into the tree trunk and into the collection container. After the first distillation, the liquid is drained and the mash removed. And so it can be distilled two or three times. And this kind of still, the Filipino still was quickly adopted by mezcal producers because it was small, easy to transport and made out of local materials. So it could be installed and used to distill a batch and then dissembled and moved quickly without leaving behind a lot of evidence, which was important because mezcal production has been illegal throughout a lot of um, the last 400 years. The larger distilleries in the case of both mezcal and tequila use copper or steel pot or column stills and the tequila company started adopting these and also the masonry ovens to roast the agave in the late 1800s. And they argued then and still do that the combination of the continuous stills and the masonry oven produced mezcals that were purer um, in terms of their taste and composition. 
So that's kind of an overview of like the different steps to make mescal. Now we're going back to the map. And so I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the distilled agave spirits likely originated over here in Western central Mexico in the Colima volcanoes region with that Filipino still. And then, as I said, the distilled spirits were subject to frequent and ongoing periods of prohibition by the colonial authorities. And this drove production into isolated rural regions. Distillation techniques then spread northward into mining communities and along trade routes and also southward into indigenous communities. And as this happened, the mescal producers adapted their techniques to every region. So I think that what really makes mescal unique and special is that it is both incredibly diverse and that diversity is still tied to particular places. So today there are at least 200 species of agave, probably more like 40 that are commonly used to make mezcal. The type of agave, the production practices, and the equipment vary between regions and sometimes even between towns or communities. So the agave might be wild or cultivated. It might be made with just one kind of agave or a blend of several different ones. Most often with mezcal, the pinas are roasted in the ground, although some of the larger distilleries use masonry ovens or autoclaves. They might then crush those pinas by um, hand with a tahona or with a mechanical mill. Most mescal producers don't add anything during fermentation, but in some places they add a little bit of pulque and some of the more just industrial distilleries add yeast or other things to speed up fermentation. The small producers often use clay or copper pot stills and it's often heated by the wood burning fire still. Some use the Filipino still that you, that you saw and then some use column stills. So we can't say there's any one kind of mezcal that would be like saying there's one kind of cheese or one kind of barbecue. The diversity of mezcal is really I think what defines it and what makes it the most special. So one of the questions that people ask me pretty often is so what is the difference between tequila and mezcal and I've kind of hinted at it but tequila is just the most famous version of mezcal so it's called tequila and it's named after the town of tequila in central Jalisco. In the late 1800s, the tequila producers, the tequileros um, in that town, in that region began to expand and industrialize. And so they started to differentiate themselves and industrialize faster than people who were making mezcal in other parts of Mexico. They were also among the first to start exporting their mezcal to the United States. And by the turn of the century, the late 1800s, people started talking about the mezcal from tequila and just shortening that to tequila. And there we have tequila. So technically all tequila is actually mezcal, but definitely all mezcal is not tequila. And so then in the 20th century, the market for tequila was growing and the tequila, the tequila producers sought protection from imposters outside of Jalisco who were trying to pass off their products as tequila. And so in 1949, the Mexican government established the first official quality standard for tequila. And this stated that tequila could be made from just one variety of agave, which we saw way back at the beginning, agave tequilana Weber, and then it had to be grown in the state of Jalisco, which is in Western Mexico, not so far from that Colima area where we think that mezcal originated. In practice though, it didn't do a whole lot to actually protect the tequila producers from people who were trying to produce tequila abroad and in other places. So in an attempt to solve this and um, legally establish tequila as Mexico's national spirit, in 19. 74 tequila became one of the first products outside of Europe to get a denomination of origin. So denominations of origin are generally established by different countries and they give people in those places, in particular places, the right to produce a food or drink. And then they set also the rules for how those foods or drinks must be produced. So the idea is that the place confers a certain taste to the product there and deserves to be protected. In the case of tequila, the denomination of origin gave Jalisco and then small parts of four other states the exclusive right to produce tequila. 20 years later in 1994, Mezcal followed suit and the, and the Mexican government declared that um, there was a denomination of origin for Mezcal and they said that there was a territory which was the only places that Mezcal could be produced to. So in terms of this talk that I'm doing, 
and why that's important, I've just told you all of these different steps about how people make mezcal and tequila, but even if you were to grow some agave, which you could definitely do, you couldn't call what you made mezcal or tequila unless you were in Mexico. You have to come up with a different name. So the controversial thing about Mexico and um, something important is that although Mexico, mezcal is definitely Mexican, and so it makes sense that it would have this kind of protection, it's also a generic term. It's not a specific, it's not a product from a specific community or a specific part of Mexico. So having a denomination of origin for mezcal is a little like having one for wine or beer in general. And then the other controversial part is that when they created the denomination of origin for mezcal, they had to define how to make it too. And at first, what they did was that the government basically copied the standards for tequila almost exactly despite the fact that, as we've seen, mezcal is generally made by much smaller producers and they use very different methods. So this means that the original standard worked pretty well for producers that looked like this. And these are pictures from tequila distilleries, but not as well um, for producers that look like this. And when I first started doing the research for my book um, a little bit over than more than 10 years ago, um, it was before the real mezcal boom that I'm going to talk about. And most of the people that I talked to in the world of mezcal, most of the producers and retailers, they mostly wanted to follow in tequila's footsteps. So the intention was to scale up, to standardize production in, in, in order to get as many people exporting and certifying as possible. But as the movement and the demand for traditional small batch mezcals made by small producers like these, has boomed and in some cases, even given these big distilleries a run for their money, the conversation has changed in ways that I think are pretty surprising. So the mezcal boom started five or six or seven years ago. And in the last few years, US imports of mezcal have soared. So they increased by more than 50% in 2019 and surpassed consumption in Mexico in that year for the first time. Mezcalerias or mezcal bars have popped up in Mexico, of course, but also in the US. And there's a growing group of bartenders and consumers and um, retailers that are aiming to promote and consume and protect traditional and artisanal mezcals. So these mezcals are presented in contrast to what one mezcal bar, the one that's shown in the picture on the left, called flavored or flavorless agave spirits, those industrially produced tequilas and mezcals that they would say have no tie to Mexican history or heritage. And with this have come some shifts in the rules that I did not predict when I started all of this. I started studying tequila uh, back in 2003, 2003, so a long time ago. And throughout nearly this entire time that I was doing the research and then writing the book, there was really one story. And that story was that every negotiation of every standard Every change to the rules to define both mezcal and tequila was pushing in the direction of standardizing and industrializing production to benefit the biggest companies. So this happened again and again. In 1949, they said that tequila had to be made from 100% agave, and then they decreased it to 70%, and then 51%, and even tried, but uh, did not succeed, it didn't last to 30% at one time. Um, another example is that flavorings were allowed to be added to tequila. They didn't require that the agave uh, used in tequila be fully matured. And so a lot of the debates and the things they were pushing in this direction, just more industrialization. And mezcal at first seemed to be following in the same footsteps and literally copying in many cases, the same standards, even though that really didn't make sense. And then a few years ago, right before I published my book, the Mescal Regulatory Agency announced that it was proposing a huge shift in the rules. So they decided to require that it be made from 100% agave. So we're talking about mescal here, not tequila, that producers list the type of agave that's used to make the mescal. And it proposed, uh, which is what small producers have been telling me they wanted for years, to have separate definitions for mescal and artisanal mescal and ancestral mescal. So they had these public forums and invited people from throughout Mexico to debate. And then in 2017, the new rules were published and they had these three categories. And this basically um, defined certain types of mezcal. So mezcal is the most open category and producers can use pit ovens or autoclaves. They can use pot stills, they can use column stills. 
There's a lot of flexibility in terms of the mezcal producers, but ancestral producers, this is the most restrictive category. They have to cook the pinas in direct fire pit ovens and they have to use the clay stills, which are pretty, pretty rare and mostly concentrated in a few communities. So this was a huge break. I had to sort of rewrite the end of the book because I was so surprised and was so different from anything else. And I think it is really important in terms of trying to um, define the diversity of mezcal a bit more, to try to account for these ties to particular places and traditions. And the process was more democratic than some of the previous iterations. At the same time, it still defines mezcal, which is clearly the most important category as essentially, it has to be produced in a region, but other than that, it's really anything you want. And of course, the categories also, they don't say anything about how the workers are treated or the farmers or even how sustainably it's produced. Still, I think it's a, a huge step in the right direction. So um, to wrap up, what does the future of mezcal and tequila look like? What should you look like? And what should you look for when you're shopping? Because people ask me that a lot too. So I am cautiously hopeful. I think consumers are more informed than ever before. I think things are changing for the better for the most part. And so I think we should, people should be choosing mezcals and tequilas that are made from diverse and sustainably produced varieties of agave when they can, according to practices that have developed in particular places. At the same time, the labels don't tell us everything. As I said, they don't tell us much about how the workers or farmers are treated. And so some of these changes can't come from the market. They have to come from laws, they have to come from the outside. But I'm still hopeful about the future of mezcal and the people that make it. And before I take questions, I'm gonna stop my video and just show you a few bottles of my own and kind of talk a little bit about some of the things you might look for. So I have to unshare. Here we go. So I thought I'd start with a tequila. And so I am in, I know that you are from all over. I'm in North Carolina. All of our liquor is sold in ABC stores for stay owned stores. So we don't have a ton of options here, but here is a pretty um, normal bottle of tequila. Uh, and tequila really doesn't have a lot of information on the label. So there's not much for me to say. I think the most important thing, and if you remember nothing else is to look for your tequila should always say 100% agave. And I think that's true no matter what you're using it for. So I know you can't see, but this says 100% agave. If it doesn't say 100%, that means it's almost definitely 51% agave and then 49% something else. It's usually sugar cane that's making up that spirit. Tequila is also gonna tell you if it is uh, blanco or joven or reposado, añejo or super añejo. And so those are categories that are regulated. They just mean how long it's aged. And so people have preferences about that. But, um, but I don't think that is indicative of the quality. I like the unaged, which is also the cheapest because I think it's the purest, but other people like the more aged tequilas. But really there's not a lot of information about tequila. It's gonna tell you where the distillery is. And if it's 100%, it's definitely going to be bottled in Mexico. If it's not, it can be shipped in bulk and bottled outside, but it doesn't tell you a lot about the methods usually. So now I wanted to show you two mezcals and both of these, I will just say are a little bit old, the labels. So they are from before when they had the cat three categories, but here's one, I got this one from Mexico. So if it had been sold in the US, it would look a little bit different, but this one has on the back, it says the type of agave. This one is from one, Ceniso Gigante. It has the name of the producer um, and the community of that producer and the state. And then it has um, words that are does it, describing how the agave was cooked, crushed, fermented. This one took only eight days and distilled. And this one was made in the clay pot stills. And then of course the agave percent, I mean the alcohol percent. So there is a lot of information, especially, I mean, I think this is a lot of information in general, but especially if you compare it to the tequila. And I will just say that I think it's an especially good sign when it says the name of the person that produced it, um, when it's not hidden by the brand, or in some cases, um, they might even mix mezcal made by different producers altogether and kind of homogenize it. So 
this one is tied to a specific batch. It actually says how many liters were produced in that batch and the year. And one thing though, that I will just point out, this is a mescal, I would consider it a mescal. The producer that makes it would consider it a mescal and the community and family that make it have been making mescal for several generations. But at least when this label was made, it, the region was not in, um, in Mexico, I mean, within the denomination of origin. So it doesn't say mescal at the top, it says Mexican distil agave distillate. So that's kind of the heart of the controversy. And then just one more before we have questions, here is one from, North Carolina from the ABC store. And so you can get more traditional mezcals here, although it's pretty hard for us. And this one has many of those same categories. It says the type of agave, the name of the per person who produced it, and all of the different, um, all of the different, like the grind, the still, the parcel, and how it is made. And so I think that that is the really fascinating and important thing about mezcal, that there is that much diversity. So thank you, everybody. It's been great to talk to you. and. Thank you so much. That's really fascinating and, uh, and helpful information. Um, we do have some questions. Um, does the post mash fermentation traditionally rely on any wild or native yeasts or bacteria? So not that they put into it, but yes, people will talk about how you know, the fact that they are located in this particular place and that the region itself like affects the, how the fermentation happens, how fast it happens. They talk a lot about seasonality in terms of fermentation as well. And um, about locating their fermentation vats in certain places and how that affects. So I think that's that idea of terroir that's behind uh, denomination of origin is very tied to that. Has uh, any agave species and the related process been introduced any place else in the world? Uh, I mean, there's definitely been, and there was a lot of illegal tequila production. I don't know exactly when it stopped, maybe in the 80s or 90s. So in Spain, in South Africa, um, there have been people that have tried to make a kind of agave distillate in California, and they're calling it something like Tequilaza or something, and the Tequila Regulatory Agency shut them down. And I just read this year um, an article about some type of agave distillate they're making in France. Um, they're not calling that mescal, but it's kind of similar. But the Tequila Regulatory Council, you know, I don't think they've been very successful in terms of like defining the quality of tequila. They have been very successful in cracking down in in terms of imposters. So. Although I think you used to see fakes occasionally, I have never found a, a fake tequila being sold out there. Um, the color of the spirits, um, does that come from the barrels and the length of time in them? Yes. So some, so with tequila, especially they focus a lot on the aging and, and then we'll talk about like some of them use different barrels like American oak or French oak. Um, but there's a lot of, that's a lot of the way that tequila is differentiated in terms of if it's young, the, the Joven, the young, or the Añejo or Reposado or Super Añejo that's, that, that with mezcal, there is aged mezcal, aged in barrels, but a lot of traditional producers say that they wouldn't age it or if they did, they would be in glass bottles. So it wouldn't have that same color. So it's not such a differentiation issue with mezcal. What flavors um, are imparted by the different distillation methods, if any? Question, and I don't even know. I think like a really good taster, you know, that there are flavors and that it would be the, com they would say, and, and people I have talked to would say it's the combination of all of these things. And it's so many factors that it would be hard to sort of test out, although of course you could do some kind of experiment, um, but the fact that it's either one variety or a blend, then whether you're fermenting with the mash or without, how it's being crushed, how long it's being fermented and where, which we talked about, and the distillation. So I'm not really sure exactly, you know, what kind of flavor a clay pot still translates versus another kind of still. I'm sure there is, is some factor, but it's a great question. And um, one more question. 
Um, did the Aztecs or other indigenous peoples use the agave to make alcohol, even if they didn't distill it? So the indigenous populations in Mexico definitely made pulque, which is fermented, but not distilled. And people still drink pulque and you can get pulque, not really in the US because it doesn't, um, it doesn't transport well because it doesn't really last very long. So you really almost always have to um, drink it in Mexico, although I, I saw it in California once. Um, and a lot of people, just to be clear, like the first written down references from 1619, but many people, including, you know, archaeologists in Mexico that I really respect their work, like they have shown and dem they, they have shown and written articles about that the indigenous populations in Mexico were distilling before the colonial settlers. Um, so, so I don't want to convey that they weren't, but even apart from that, pulque goes back way, 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 way further. Um, and people were making that long before colonialization. Okay. Well, I think that's all the questions we have time for. Thank you so much for that fascinating talk. Um, fermentology will continue on May 6th with, with Heather Paxson, uh, she'll be teaching us about the safety of fermented foods, in particular raw milk versus pasteurized cheeses. So see you next time. Thank you.